throughout this evening. Elsewhere throughout the night, it should stay largely dry away from the coasts and over the hills, but it's going to be a very cloudy and mild night. Temperatures again, double digits by for a minimum. Across the far northeast of Scotland, it should be a fairly dry and bright start, perhaps some areas in the Midlands as well. But by and large, it's going to be a fairly cloudy start to the day. It'll likely stay quite cloudy and wet for much of the day across parts of western Scotland, northwest England, Northern Ireland as well. But elsewhere, it should brighten up and it'll feel fairly warm once again in that sunshine. We could see temperatures as high as 21 degrees on Friday. That band of rain becomes a more weak feature, but it will sink into more northern areas of Wales, more widely across northern England, perhaps into the Midlands later on in the day and Saturday. Behind it, it turns much more unsettled, some showery outbreaks of rain. It'll also turn considerably colder for those northwestern areas. But in the south, it should remain largely dry and bright for the weekend. A brighter outlook with Box Solar. Sponsors of weather on GB News. Variety Cruises have been sailing since 1942, and thanks to them, you could set sail in 2025. You have the chance to win a seven-night small boat cruise for two worth £10,000. With your flights, meals, drinks and excursions included, you can choose from any one of their 2025 Greek adventures and find your home at sea. You'll also win an incredible £10,000 in tax-free cash that you can use to make this summer spectacular. We'll also treat you to these luxury travel gifts. For another chance to win a prize worth over £20,000, text PRIZE to 63232. Text costs £2 plus one standard network rate message. Or post your name and number to GB04 PO Box 8690 Derby DE1 9 UK only. Entrance must be 18 or over. Lines close at 5pm on the 26th of April. Full terms and privacy notice at gbnews.com forward slash win. Please check the closing time if listening or watching on demand. Good luck. 2024, a battleground year. The year the nation decides. As the parties gear up their campaigns for the next general election. Who will be left standing when the British people make one of the biggest decisions of their lives? Who will rise? And who will fall? Let's find out together. For every moment, the highs, the lows, the twists and turns. We'll be with you for every step of this journey. In 2024, GB News is Britain's election channel. GB News is the home of free speech. We were created to champion it, and we deliver it day in, day out. Free speech allows us all to explore and debate openly the issues most important to us, our families, and of course, the British people. Having challenging conversations to enlighten each other. Which is why we hear all sides of the argument. We are the people's channel. We will always stand by the freedom to express yourself. On TV, radio, and online. This is GB News, Britain's news channel. Are the newspapers getting you down? My wife didn't divorce me that month. <laughs> Struggling to separate the wheat from the chaff. I know that it's a bit of a circus at the best of times. <laughs> well, don't worry. Headliners has got you covered. We'll take the burden of reading the day's news, and if we get depressed, who cares? It's an occupational hazard, frankly. That's Headliners on GB News from 11pm till midnight, and the following morning, 5 till 6am, on GB News, the comedy channel. Nah, just kidding. Britain's news channel. Hello, good evening, it's me, Jacob Rees-Mogg, on State of the Nation. Tonight, the United Nations Climate Chief has confidently declared... We have two years to save the world. Well, in that case, it's too late, and I think that's our cue to abandon the green agenda. Meanwhile, as the Home Office is unable to confirm to GB News how many foreign criminals were deported last year, an Afghan sex offender has won a deportation case owing to risk of mob violence in his home country. Another loss for the democratic will of the people. The mighty Boris Johnson has bravely and boldly come out in defence of cigar smokers as the nanny state continues its attack 
evoking one of our greatest statesmen, Winston Churchill, who was known to chomp through ten cigars a day. Plus, State of the Nations Book Club returns, this time with an heir to one of Europe's longest-lasting dynasties, the Habsburgs, Archduke Edward von Habsburg. Um, he is the ambassador from Hungary to the Holy See, and he'll be joining me to discuss his new book, The Habsburg Way. State of the Nation starts now. I'll also be joined by my most intellectual panel, GB News's senior political commentator, Nigel Nelson, and the journalist and conservative peer, Paul Goodman. As always, I want to hear from you. It's a crucial part of the programme. Email me, mailmog at gbnews.com. But now it's your favourite part of the evening. It's the news of the day with Polly Middlehurst. Jacob, thanks very much indeed, and good evening to you. Well, our top story from the GB Newsroom tonight, a sub-postmistress who was wrongly jailed while she was pregnant has refused to accept the apology of a post office executive who sent an email in 2010 saying her conviction was brilliant. David Smith told the post office inquiry today that with hindsight he understood the anger and upset, as well as the substantial distress he'd caused to Seema Misra and her family, saying he was sorry for the way his email had been perceived and portrayed. Mrs Misra was falsely accused of stealing £74,000 and had to give birth wearing a probation tag. She said, I was eight weeks pregnant. They need to apologise to my youngest son. It was terrible. Between 1999 and 2015, more than 900 sub-postmasters were prosecuted due to the flawed Horizon IT software. Today, the Prime Minister said his plan is working, as new NHS figures showed hospital waiting lists in England had fallen for the fifth month in a row. Over 305,000 people have been waiting more than a year to start routine hospital treatment at the end of February, but that's down from just over 320,000 at the end of January. The Government and NHS England both pledged to eliminate all waiting lists of more than a year by March next year, and Rishi Sunak said there's more yet to be done. Well, when I became Prime Minister, I said that cutting waiting lists was one of my five priorities. And whilst we haven't made as much progress as I would have liked, today's figures show that we are making headway towards that goal. Over the last five months, a reduction of around 200,000 in the overall waiting list, which is positive. And if it wasn't for industrial action, an extra 430,000 patients would have been treated. So whilst there's, of course, a lot more work to do, the plan is working. Hundreds of Tata steel workers are set to go on strike over the proposed closure of Port Albert's blast furnaces in Wales. Around 1,500 steel workers based in Port Albert and Clanwern in South Wales have voted for industrial action over the company's plan to close the furnaces, resulting in the potential job losses of 2,800 positions. It's the first time in over 40 years that Port Albert steel workers have gone on strike. As you've been hearing, the former Prime Minister Boris Johnson has attacked Rishi Sunak's flagship no-smoking policy as absolutely nuts as he criticised the state of the Conservative Party while at an event in Canada. The Prime Minister's plan would prevent anyone who's turning 15 this year or younger from ever being able to legally buy tobacco products. Boris Johnson expressed his frustration at the idea. Some of the things that we're, we're, we're doing now, I think, that, or that are being done in the name of conservatism, I think they're absolutely, absolutely nuts. Uh, but, you know, we're banning cigars. Mm. And what, what, what is... I mean, maybe, maybe you all think that's a great idea. I just can't, I just can't see... Well, what, does, what is the point of banning... Well, the, the party of Winston Churchill wants to ban... <laughs> I mean... Donnez, donnez moi un break, as they say in Quebec. You know, it, it's, it's just... It, it's just... It's just mad. Boris Johnson. For the latest stories, sign up for GB News Alerts, scan the QR code on your screen or go to gbnews.com slash alerts. Climate hysteria has officially reached its peak and in doing so undermined itself. United Nations Climate Chief Simon Steele has boldly declared that we have two years to save the world. He went on to say... Some of you may think the title of today's event is overly dramatic, melodramatic even. Well, some people would certainly say that, and I'm one of them. But what does Mr Steele actually have to say to back up these bold claims? First, he makes this claim. 
We are at the start of a race which will determine the biggest winners in a new clean energy economy. Each country's climate responses will be key to whether they rise up the ladder or fall. But the markets do not concur with this sentiment. If it makes economic sense to pursue the green agenda, the markets would naturally follow this trend. So why then in China and India, two of the biggest emitters of carbon dioxide in the world, still burning coal and indeed building more coal power stations? This leads me on to the next point, which is that Mr Steele talks about global cooperation and coming together. Countries like China aren't interested in coming together for the green agenda. Why? Because it doesn't make economic sense to do so, especially when you still have a partly subsistence economy. Mr Steele also said this. For many countries, they will only be able to implement strong new climate plans if we see a quantum leap in climate finance this year. So he admits that this will cost a fortune, but then goes on to undermine his entire point. Because it's hard for any government to invest in renewables or climate resilience when Treasury coffers are bare, debt servicing costs have overtaken health spending, new borrowing is impossible, and the wolves of poverty are at the door. So it's clear that we can't afford it. Then he rather predictably goes on to adopt the socialist language of inequality before saying this. We need a new deal on climate finance between developed and developing countries. More concessional finance, especially for the poorest and most vulnerable countries. Well, that translates into saying that he wants you, the British taxpayer, to pay climate reparations. And I can assure him there is no democratic mandate for that in the United Kingdom. But finally, Mr Steele went on to say this. At the spring meetings, we need an ambitious round of replenishment for the World Bank's International Development Association, IDA. Doing so could lift hundreds of millions of people out of poverty. But everyone knows fundamentally that the way the world has lifted millions out of poverty is through the provision of cheap energy. And then there's one way to do that, and that's by boosting supply and bringing to an end the costly green agenda. And now we have the perfect excuse to do that. The world is apparently going to end in two years. Well, the UK contributes just 1% of global emissions and only two years before we're all doomed. There's nothing we can do about it. So as it's too late, surely there's no need to try. We should concentrate on what we can do, improving living standards with cheap energy. As ever, let me know your thoughts. Mailmog at gbnews.com. Well, I'm joined now by three very distinguished men who I think have just about uh, managed not to um, pass out with irritation at what I've just <laughs> been saying. Uh, they disagree with me very strongly. The environment lawyer and campaigner for Defend Our Juries, Tim Crossland, the chairman of London Climate Change Partnership, Bob Ward, and the Conservative MP, uh, con former co Conservative MEP, Stanley Johnson. Well, thank you very much for joining me. Um, Tim, it does seem to me that this type of overstatement damages the green agenda. When you say it's two years before we're all doomed, it makes it very easy for people like me to say, well, if it's two years, why are we bothering? Maybe we should get away from looking to the future and looking at predictions and looking at what's actually happening now. Yesterday, what we heard from farming groups in the UK was that the level of rainfall is damaging our British food security. It's slashing wheat production putting prices up for consumers. This is happening now. Homeowners in Carlisle now are unable to get insurance for their homes because of the flood risk. How many times they've actually already been flooded. So when you talk about abandoning the green agenda, what you're really talking about is abandoning your yeah. constituents who are feeling no, these impacts no, no, right no, now. No, it's not, because this is similar levels of um, rain that we've had in the 1870s, and that similarly wiped out uh, a crop that year. This has happened before. Uh, in Somerset, the main reason the levels flooded 10 years ago is because the Environment Agency had stopped the dredging uh, of the... Um, drains that had been built in the 18th and 19th century to make the land more productive. It was a deliberately environmental policy that made farming on the levels more difficult. Jake, what, what you're advancing there is science. You're, you're not a scientist. You're, you're saying things that are contrary to the scientific consensus. No, no, I'm not, which is, I'm not challenging which is, the science. I'm just saying these things have happened before. That, that's not, not denied scale. by the science. Not, not on this scale. Well, in the UK, the weather has been wet before. We all know that. But, the, the, the level of impact on crops, not just in the UK, but around the world, is unprecedented. But crops need heat to grow. Bob? Well, the Met Office evidence is really clear, Sir Jacob. 
it is getting uh, rainier in the UK. The level of flooding is more. The last 18 months have been <coughs> the wettest 18 month period we have ever but that, had but that's on record. But that's a so it's wrong to uh, claim long, that we've seen how, this all before. How long do the records that's go back? That's why your constituents are suffering. How long do the records go back? 1836. Okay. You quoted the 1870s. I did. It That's isn't. Right. It That's right. wasn't. But this is, in the this 1870s. Is, no, if you take it for 12 months rather than 18 well, months. Well, you can cherry pick is, whatever is, you want to do. You I think your constituents, your constituents people, want to hear what you're going to do about most it. Most people Jacob. go for annual you're just rainfall. Saying, I don't care I'm about saying, it. I'm saying have cheap energy. Why don't you want to do anything about because it? Because we are <clears> making the poor in this country and in the world poorer. In the UK, a kilowatt hour of electricity is 44 cents. In the US, it is 17 cents. That is ruining our economy and making my constituents cold and poor. Well, I, as you know, Sir Jacob, you spent £78 billion of taxpayers' money bailing out consumers because the price of natural gas went up. £78 billion pounds that went into the pockets of the energy companies. And you called back half through the windfall tax. That's not we, wise use of we, their money. The people are done, poor and cold because of your policies. If we'd done fracking and we'd kept coal... and. Well, had this green exactly. Go back to it. the 1950s. I want to pick up on your analysis of the speech. Now, Jacob, I don't think you were very fair. This guy, this man, Mr. Steele, he didn't say the world is going to come to an end. He did. He even said, he said, we've got I've got his speech here. Yeah, I'm sorry, I've read the speech word for word. He said that within two years we have to get our act together, otherwise we are he, certainly not going to meet the targets. He begins no. by the very bit I quoted, that we saying have two years, years to save the world may sound a bit melodramatic. Well, and that's and why I you, quoted but, it. But you are the one who made it sound, because you say two, uh, in two, he years, in two years of the world end. It may be melodramatic, but it's not the same as saying the world is end. going to end in two years, which is the impression you gave. What I'm saying is he's saying something really, really important. A, G20 actually are producing still 80% of the world's you know, carbon emissions. G20, the rich countries, including, by the way, India and China. Yeah, but they're not rich. They not in still, GDP per capita terms. No, they are still and producing... I'm not, I'm, not, I'm, I'm not here to argue the individual. I'm taking the G20 as a whole, who are on the whole are richer than the people who are not G20 now. OK. Well, that's not quite in, true. In, in two years no, time. that's not, because in two um, years lots time. of countries aren't in the G20 who aren't as big as China and India, where the populations are richer. So it's not completely okay. accurate. In two years' time, he is saying, in terms of climate finance, he's saying the next COP meeting at Baku in, in Azerbaijan has absolutely to concentrate on climate finance. And I think he's right. You think he's right about but that? that is higher taxes for British people. Well, we are part of a world. So you are advocating higher taxes for British people? Uh, I am not. Because I'm not. You see, on, I want tax cuts. On. I am one of the people who do believe in the myth of people, other people think of sustainable growth. I think sustainable growth does work, and sustainable growth actually generates taxes. I did something with uh, Liam Fox, and it was called uh, the, the case for carbon, carbon taxing, the case for carbon pricing. If you have a proper carbon pricing system, you will generate uh, quite a lot of funds and you'll also deal with, but, with, with climate change. Jim, well. I mean, I think Stanley's made a very important point, that taxes will have to go up in the West to pay for this type of approach that Mr Steele is advocating. I don't think people in the UK, highest tax rate in 70 years, want to pay higher taxes. I think the public want to protect themselves, they want to protect the people that they love, and I think we need to be honest, we need to level with the public. It is true that fossil fuels have lifted people out of poverty historically. It is true our economies are highly dependent on them. It is also true that what sustains us is destroying us. But no, I, you see, I think we your need point to be is, honest about that. I think that. your point's fundamental, because I've got the figures here. There were 1.9 billion people in 1990 in absolute poverty. That has gone down to 700 million. It's 35% to 17.1%. This is a phenomenal achievement created by increasing trade and by cheap energy. That, that has made 1.2 billion people's lives better. There are another 700 million we need to lift out of poverty. That's cheap energy. It's not expensive energy. But what we're seeing now is that... It has done that historically. It is now putting more and more people into poverty. It is about to destroy. We're, we're really interested in the fact evidence that the for fossil fuel companies themselves, back in the 80s, said at the rate of climate change that we're seeing now, we will see the end of economic growth in 2025. This was in 19, 1980 because of the impacts but, but, that but, clim the climate crisis is having. Well, if I can bring you in. Countries with cheaper energy prices are growing faster, and you've seen this, that US has grown much faster than Europe, 
because it's had fracking and it's had cheaper energy. And this has been really important. Energy costs correlate very strongly with GDP growth and with lifting people out of poverty. Well, I'm not sure where you've been for the last two years, but we've just had a massive cost of living crisis in Britain that was mainly yeah. driven by the fact that we're dependent on natural gas and then that natural gas spiked no, and didn't. people could they, had to choose between heating or eating. They didn't Don't tell me fossil fuels are cheap. They're demonstrably they not. That. They didn't have that in America because they'd done fracking and they had their own well, supplies. And we haven't done we it don't, we, we don't have, we don't have, we're not the United States, we don't have all that gas. We you can frack in your constituents' back garden, see how popular that is. But the point is that when you accuse India and China of not being interested in the green agenda, it's, it's people like you who complain about the fact that China is building so many cheap electric vehicles yeah. that they're going to out-compete <laughs> British, British manufacturers. I'm not in favour of them competing. Yeah. I just don't think the electric vehicles are any good. I the electric like vehicles. Stanley, you're an electric vehicle man. I'm not, actually. You're not. But having just having said that, they do work. I have just, as you know, spent eight weeks in China, and I've got to say, the revolution which you see there is an energy-based revolution, and part of that is also the electric vehicle. So with a lot of coal in China? China or has 1,200 million people, and China has still uh, a per capita income which is way below even the UK's. Well, thank you very much to Tim, Bob and Stanley. I'm very grateful for them coming in because they probably knew my views before they came. <laughs> and this is just the sort of discussion we need and like to have, so thank you. Uh, coming up, can you guess how many deportations of foreign criminals were made last year? GB News asked the Home Office and I'll tell you the number after the break. And from one member of the Johnson family to another, find out why our formidable former Prime Minister is not happy with the upcoming cigar ban. Plus, you'll want to keep watching for my interview with an heir to one of Europe's longest-lasting dynasties to discuss his new book. Britain's Newsroom. Weekday mornings from 9.30. It's a remarkable story, isn't it? Amazing. Extraordinary. And also, she was unflappable, apparently, yeah. the Princess Royal. She just brilliant. refused to get out of the car and said, I'm not going anywhere. Extraordinary. Well, Jim Beaton was awarded the George Cross for protecting the princess and delighted to say, joins us now, along with the former head of Royal Royalty Protection, Di Davis. Jim, you won't remember, but I met you some time ago at the Imperial War Museum when Princess Anne was opening an exhibition to do with the George Cross and you were there reunited with her, um, and you told me then what great admiration you had for the princess, cool under fire, but you didn't do so badly yourself. It was probably my job, and also um, I had a wee bit of police training, not very much, but a little bit, uh, whereas uh, Princess Anne had nothing, and yet the way she displayed it, you would have thought she'd been uh, highly trained to... Um, deal with any type of that situation. Even though you'd had some training, you took three bullets for the princess. You effectively stood between her and a deranged gunman. Well, I was supposed to be a protection officer, really, so um, I just tried to fuddle about. You must remember that back in 1974, there was no communication, and we were extremely lucky that Michael Hill's who was outside Clarence House and nearby, had got one of the fast police radios, um, or radios on his shoulder, so he was able to send a message out. Otherwise, we would have just been relying on the good old public to phone in and say there was something happening. Yeah, so been... times have changed drastically. I'm Andrew Doyle. Join me at 7 o'clock every Sunday night for Free Speech Nation, the show where I tackle the week's biggest stories in politics and current affairs with the help of my two comedian panellists and a variety of special guests. Free Speech Nation, Sunday nights from 7 on GB News, the People's Channel, Britain's news channel. Every Sunday from 11, join Michael Portillo. There will be topical discussion, looking at the week before and the week to come. So kick back and relax at 11 a.m. on Sundays on GB News with me, Michael Portillo. GB News, the people's channel, Britain's news channel. 
Good afternoon, Britain. Good afternoon, Britain. Weekdays from midday, we bring you the most compelling stories from across the United Kingdom. And why it matters to you. From your doorstep to our inbox. That's right, we want to hear from you. Good afternoon, Britain. Only on GB News, the People's Channel, Britain's news channel. Well, you've been sending in a lot of mail mugs, I'm glad to say. Carter says, absolute rubbish, what nonsense. I'd rather have a 25% cut in my energy bill and take my chances. George says, surprise, surprise, it rains in Scotland. The great flood of Murray in 1829. The muckle spate see the water rise to one foot under the central span of Telford's famous Craigellachie Bridge. And I probably mangled the pronunciation. And Peter, thank you, Peter, I like your comment. It's almost like watching the BBC. Three climate advocates versus JRM. Bring them on, I say. Before the break, I asked if you could guess how many foreign criminals the Home Office deported in 2023, promising to reveal the answer. And unfortunately, we have no idea because the um, Home Office has got muddled. GB News asked the Home Office and it explained it had a disruption to its data system. We do, however, have the figures to September, 3,577. But government inefficiency to one side, the point is that any foreign criminal should be deported, crucially, before serving their sentence. As it currently stands, nearly 12% of people in prisons are foreign, making up about 10,000 of a total of 85,000. Just to add insult to injury, news today has revealed an Afghan sex offender has won his deportation case owing to the fact that he would have faced the risk of mob violence in his home country of Afghanistan. Well, I have um, my most intellectual panel with me, GB News' senior political commentator, Nigel Nelson, and the journalist and Conservative peer, Paul Goodman. Nigel, shouldn't we just remove people as quickly as possible? Certainly, if you can find somewhere to send them. Um, home. Well, which home? I mean, the, we take the issue of the Afghan. If you are facing uh, danger or even death in your home country, we cannot, under international law, send them back there. And nor should we. We're a civilised country. We should not allow people to be persecuted or even worse, killed in their home country. So the question then is, where do they go if they don't go home? But this creates perverse incentives, doesn't it? So you're getting the issue we've had on false conversions to Christianity and people um, who have committed sex offences want to tell everybody they've committed sex offences because we then won't send them back. Well, I mean, the, the, just because we have a few wrong ones doesn't mean that every asylum seeker uh, it, it, um, is one. So, um, th this particular Afghan you're talking about can't be sent back because he faces danger at home. And if that is the law, a judge has got no, no option but to, uh, but to grant him refugee status in this country. I've had a constituent write to me say that we should basically get rid of everybody who's come illegally within 24 hours of them landing. I think she's right, don't you? I'm not sure the Home Office, from what you were saying a few moments ago, is in a position to do that. <laughs> no, um, but I'd like, to, I'd like to just come back briefly to the point about the Afghan and what um, Nigel said, then we can discuss whether the Home Office should be in a position to do that or not. It seems to me there are two fundamental issues here we keep coming back to. The first is all about citizenship. Do you owe a prior duty to protect your citizens? I think the answer to that is yes. Now, to Nigel's point that you're sending someone abroad potentially to face the death sentence, you kind of get a second question, which is, are the courts now more political with a capital P than they were? If you look at this case, it's not the case that the court said the government of Afghanistan will subject this person to capital punishment. It's a decision about what a mob might or might not do. That sounds like creeping politicisation to me. Yes, and I, because I, I actually agree with Nigel, I think we shouldn't, as we don't have the death penalty ourselves, send people back to face a capital charge. On the other no, I don't hand, think your constituent wants to send everyone back in 24 hours. Would agree that with either. That. No, no, I think she probably would. I think she wouldn't want to take a risk to life and limb. But it becomes pretty theoretical when you say there may be a mob who will stand outside their house and shout at them. That, that was my instinct, looking at the, the case. And this question of whether courts are 
taking decisions that elected people should make is a very big topical question. And Nigel, that's a very fair point, isn't it? It is, but I would have thought, I, I would have thought there, Paul, that what they're doing is they're interpreting the law as it actually stands. And so if you can't send someone back to a, back to a country because they face a risk of harm in that country, that is purely interpreting the law um, isn't as we this have though, it. Isn't this interpretive law that, that Parliament hasn't said if there's a mob outside your house, you can't be sent back? Because Parliament never legislates to that level of detail. That's right. It's used this broader concept of threat to create a view of a very theoretical But threat. that's what judges are there for, that they have to interpret the laws that you guys They have become more political because they've decided to replace there's, the judgment yeah, of an official. Yeah, not a political yeah. decision. There's, there's, there's a question about when you're interpreting the law and where you cross over a boundary when you actually begin to make the law, and that's the question that's, that's at stake here. Harold Wilson was one of the dominant political figures of the last century, whose premiership changed the face of Britain. Now, nearly 50 years after he left office, it has been revealed by his press secretary, Joe Haynes, that the former Prime Minister had an affair with a member of his staff during his last two years in Downing Street. The liaison was kept secret until this month when Haynes lifted the lid. The question now, as people froth over the revelation, is whether it affects the way in which Wilson will be remembered. Prime Minister for eight years, he was responsible for, in my view, damaging the British economy as the value of the pound fell. Meanwhile, he enacted a number of reforming social policies, abolishing the death penalty, decriminalising homosexuality and doing away with theatre censorship. Should this sensational new detail trigger a re-examination of his legacy or is it mere purience? Nigel, you actually worked for Joe Haynes, so I this did. is very much something you know about. Yes, um, one of the things that Joe never actually told me about either when I did work for him. Um, yeah, I mean, I think that the that why Joe did this was that his view is that at, uh, at this late stage, when all the participants are now dead, it is right to put this in the history books to actually... So you've got everything accurate about Harold Wilson's premiership. Um, that seems right to me. question of, of whether people would think uh, less of Harold Wilson was a what, what happened? Probably not. They, they didn't of, of uh, John, John Kennedy. But all the conversation on Wilson has been about the late Marcia Faulkinder rather than this particular member of staff. Does it change the view of that and her power in relation to him and her dominance of him, which is, I mean, I don't know from first hand, but obviously has been reported. Well, I mean, Joe's sidekick from, the, from those years, uh, Bernard Donoghue, said that Harold Wilson did, in fact, have a fling with Marcia Falkender, but a long time before he was Prime Minister. Um, it's certainly everyone's th has thought of um, Marcia Falkender's influence. According to what um, Joe Haynes is saying, is that Janet uh, Hewlett-Davis didn't have any particular influence over Harold Wilson. She was in love with him and in the last years of his premiership, made, she made him happy. I mean, is this mere vulgar curiosity, like the fact that we talk about Gladstone doing his night walks to convert prostitutes and now there's a bit of salacious stuff on Harold Wilson? Or does it change how we think the country was being governed and the level of cover-up and so on? I don't think it changes very much what one thinks about Harold Wilson as a bloke, because the Marcia uh, Falkland uh, affair has been written about extensively. So it's not as though um, people were under the illusion, if you follow Harold Wilson's story, that, you know, he had a very conventional private life and we've had the shocking revelation. So that doesn't really change anything, it seems to me. And fundamentally, it doesn't change anything about the politics. I mean, Wilson was, you know, some people will think um, he was a rather grey, ineffective... Um, ineffectual Prime Minister, sort of your view, but he was actually a terrific election winner. Oh, yeah, for I wouldn't call him he won, he, won, he won, you know, five out of the four he was elections. He a phenomenal he, campaign he the white heat of technology. Absolutely. All, I mean, he was very, he was like Blair in this respect, that he yeah, was I mean, able to put his finger on the pulse of the nation. Yes, compared to Blair, he doesn't sort of look like much, this rather owly, owlish, donnish figure, but he was a terrific campaigner. But, Nigel, I want to ask you about this because he had a very carefully cultivated image as a man of the people. So he smoked a pipe in public, but I think one of Boris Johnson's cigars in private. Indeed. Um, he went round in a Ganex Mac to look like an ordinary chap. In fact, he was smoking cigars and having affairs. Does this change 
the view of what type of person he was? Uh, well, I don't think so. I mean, th I mean that's the, the image bit. Um, and politicians have always had, some, uh, had image creators. And in Harold Wilson's case, it was Joe Haynes. So uh, Joe, for instance, turned on a knighthood uh, that was offered to him after he left Number 10 because he didn't want to change himself. But certainly, when it came to Harold Wilson's image, he designed that for that reason. Uh, but that goes back to things like John Major's soapbox or whatever. I mean, politicians do that to have a particular image they put out to the public. Black, as indeed you do. <laughs> I'm just who I am. It's very straightforward. Anyway, thank you to my panel. Coming up next, a certain former Prime Minister, whose father you may have heard of too, has invoked another former Prime Minister in his censure of the nanny state's attack on tobacco and cigar smokers. Plus, don't forget, today's Nation's Book Club features Archduke Edward von Habsburg on his new book, The Habsburg Way. Good evening. Welcome to your latest GB News weather update. Well, it will be a cloudy start tomorrow, but it should brighten up later on in the day. But for the far northwest, we're likely to see fairly persistent rain. High pressure is starting to spread its influence into southern areas of the UK, but further north and west, we'll see weather fronts push in through the next few days. And this evening, much of the rain will be restricted to the far north and west of Scotland. Also, parts of northwest England, Cumbria, will likely see some heavy bursts of rain throughout this evening. Elsewhere throughout the night, it should stay largely dry away from the coasts and over the hills, but it's going to be a very cloudy and mild night. Temperatures again, double digits by, for a minimum. Across the far northeast of Scotland, it should be a fairly dry and bright start, perhaps some areas in the Midlands as well. But by and large, it's going to be a fairly cloudy start to the day. It'll likely stay quite cloudy and wet for much of the day across parts of western Scotland, northwest England, Northern Ireland as well. But elsewhere, it should brighten up and it'll feel fairly warm once again in that sunshine. We could see temperatures as high as 21 degrees on Friday. That band of rain becomes a more weak feature, but it will sink into more northern areas of Wales, more widely across northern England, perhaps into the Midlands later on in the day and Saturday. Behind it, it turns much more unsettled, some showery outbreaks of rain. It'll also turn considerably colder for those northwestern areas. But in the south, it should remain largely dry and bright for the weekend. GB News is the home of free speech. We were created to champion it, and we deliver it day in, day out. Free speech allows us all to explore and debate openly the issues most important to us, our families, and of course, the British people. Having challenging conversations to enlighten each other. Which is why we hear all sides of the argument. We are the people's channel. We will always stand by the freedom to express yourself. On TV, radio, and online. This is GB News, Britain's news channel. I'm Christopher Hope. And I'm Gloria DiPiero, bringing you... PMQ's Live here on GB News. Whenever Parliament is in session on a Wednesday at midday, we'll bring you live coverage of Prime Minister's questions. We'll be asking our viewers and listeners to submit the questions that they would like to put to the Prime Minister, and we'll put that to our panel of top politicians in our Westminster studio. That's PMQ's Live here on GB News, Britain's election channel. I think the most exciting bit for me is talking to people. People who I think are ignored often by the major news channels, we're going to give news they want to hear. There's a voice there that needs to be heard. I think there's a chance here for a diversity of opinion to be expressed, which you don't find elsewhere. It's really exciting. We don't hold back. We're free to say how decisions that are taken here affect us all around the country. Only on GB News, the People's Channel, Britain's news channel. Are the newspapers getting you down? My wife didn't divorce me that month. <laughs> <laughs> Struggling to separate the wheat from the chaff. I know that it's a bit of a circus at the best of times. <laughs> well, don't worry. Headliners has got you covered. We'll take the burden of reading the day's news, and if we get depressed, who cares? It's an occupational hazard, frankly. That's Headliners on GB News from 11pm till midnight, and the following morning, 5 till 6am, on GB News, the comedy channel. Nah, just kidding. Britain's news channel that might be in wait for, for him in his home country. Where are the rights of his victims? I'm so tired and frustrated at the powerlessness we have. Well, Michelle, I think that is a fine point. When one thinks of the Conservative Party, it's hard not to have even a flash of memory of one Sir Winston Churchill, a man who saved Europe from fascism and preserved British liberties. The mentioned mental image of Sir Winston will inevitably include his donning and puffing on his favourite Romeo and Julieta cigar, accompanying 
bowler hat and throngs of adoring crowds. However, contemporary Conservative Party leadership has moved away from Sir Winston's trademark habits as Rishi Sunak last year announced plans to phase out all legal means of smoking over the next few years. Speaking in Canada alongside firebrand, freedom-loving ex-Australian Premier Tony Abbott, Boris, Johnson's, uh, Boris Johnson lamented his successor's plan to ban cigars as being distinctly unconservative. I look at some of the things that we're, we're, we're doing now, I think, that, or that are being done in the name of conservatism, I think they're absolutely, absolutely nuts. We're banning cigars. Mm. And what, what, what is, I mean, maybe, that, maybe you all think that's a great idea. I just can't, I just can't see, well, what, the, what is the point of banning with well, the, the party of Winston Churchill wants to ban? <laughs> well, it's absolutely nuts. A very fine and pithy way of putting it. And on the topic of illustrious... British cultural figures defending freedom of choice. The boss of 007's preferred motor brand, at least in the films. Um, it's an Aston Martin in the films, in the books, as many gentlemen do. Bond preferred a Bentley. Anyway, he has uh, said a hard doctor no to the state's attempt to coerce car makers into transitioning to electric vehicles, claiming they will only stop making petrol cars when they have absolutely no other choice. At the earliest, that'll be 2027. So is it time for big government to die another day? I'm joined now by my distinguished panel, GB News' senior political commentator, Nigel Nelson, and the journalist and conservative peer, Paul Goodman. So, um, we should have a freedom to smoke cigars and our children and our children's children and our children's children's children should have this right to. I love Boris Johnson's way of having his cake and eating it. Um, because um, there he is, uh, spontaneously answering a question. And by the way, it's very seldom he's rude in public about Rishi Sunak's government. It's not something he tends to do. Well, I was just sort of thinking back to the Johnson government. And in fact, if I remember rightly, there was a fracking ban. There was a ban on junk food advertising after uh, 9 p.m. And of course, there was you know, the biggest state intervention of all, there was lockdown. So Boris's ability to project what is genuinely a part of him, this sort of freedom-loving bit, while occasionally doing the opposite, is fabulous. But, of course, he is right on the issue. He's right on the issue, and this is a terrible distraction for the Conservatives. When you've got an election coming up, we're dealing with something that's fundamentally trivial and unenforceable. Well, uh, it's clearly something that the Prime Minister wants to do. I suppose it must be the case that very few people, I imagine, in his circle smoke. Perhaps that is fed into his interest in the policy in some way. Um, that's a fair point, isn't it? Probably not many of them smoke, and most of them did maths to 18, and those were his big conference announcements. But it doesn't really set the pulse racing of the voter, does it? No, and I think he was looking for something uh, at party conference to, to say, so he sort of grabbed on this policy. I think the last Prime Minister to smoke was David Cameron, who did it uh, in secret. Surreptitiously, yes. Yeah, that's right. Um, and Nick Clegg as well, his, his deputy. So they were both both smokers. Um, I mean, I think that um, Boris Johnson's argument seems to be the same one you would have for legalising crack cocaine. If it's all about freedom, it, 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 it's a freedom of choice. Not, not you quite, because this policy is so bizarre that, that I've got lots of children and my two eldest children will be able to carry on buying cigarettes for the rest of their life. Numbers three to six will not be able to. This is just weird, isn't it? When you get to 50 and your 51-year-old sister can buy you a packet of cigarettes it's a bit stupid. It is weird. I mean, if you're, you're born on New Year's Eve, that uh, uh, you'll be able to smoke. If you're born on New, Year, New Year's Day, you won't. And that seems to be ludicrous. So, uh, while I'm in favour of the policy in general, I think that things like that, the anomalies that it'll create, need to be sorted out. So, it may be, for instance, you extend the whole thing, not do it all in a rush, um, and you make it for anyone born after the, it gets royal assent. And now switching to Aston Martin, switching gear, one might say, <laughs> makers, if it has to be said, the most beautiful cars that one ever sees. Isn't it marvellous that they're going to stick to petrol? They're going to make proper cars and they're not going to be bullied into these nasty electric cars that won't work. Well, you've had sort of three environmentalists in so we're giving you a hard time <laughs> earlier early on this evening. Um, it's back, to, the, it's back to, the, to that argument again. If you think that climate change is worth doing something about, then that includes Aston Martin. That should be happening now. We keep moving our targets back. Uh, 2030, it used to be for uh, everything to be electric. Now it's 2035. The idea will make the, the one and a half degrees by um, uh, 2050 is, is fast going out the window. Think of that wonderful scene in Goldfinger when James Bond is driving his Aston Martin 
uh, around the Swiss mountains. He wouldn't be able to do that in an electric car, would he? He'd run out of power. Of course. I suppose the answer to that is there weren't electric cars then, and some of them might be able to do it. But I but, don't entirely agree with this, this argument about targets. On the whole, I think, a more conservative approach with a small c is incentives. And what we are beginning to see about the targets is that the nearer they get, the less likely it looks as though you're going to hit them, so they get moved back. But in, Aston Martin is interesting because it's not a cost issue. With, with most cars, with family cars, the electric car is just more expensive than the petrol car. Aston Martins are very, very expensive cars, and if they have an electric motor, that probably makes them a bit more expensive, but not significantly the type of people who are buying them. I'm, so this is a really, I think, important statement I'm by Aston Martin. I'm not a master of the economics of Aston Martins, but it just seems to me quite likely that the, um, the people who run the firm have seen a commercial opportunity here. To carry on with petrol to cars. To carry on with petrol Whilst cars. other people may be switching, because I see Bentley has just decided to stop production of, I think it's its W12 engine. It's phasing out its petrol engine, taking last orders. And Aston Martin's going to carry on, so we'll all be like James Bond, we'll be preferring Aston Martin's in more modern area, having preferred Bentley's in the older era. Well, clearly, by 2035, they're going to have to do it whether they like it or not. Do you think they will? Don't you think the law will change again because people will shift it back? They'll see the cost and they'll say, oh, we're not doing that. Well, if they shift it back again, um, it gets worse and worse. I mean, I just think that, may, that, that we're not then keeping but up to our, but, to our promises on climate isn't change. isn't what you worry about actually what is happening and that when you face politicians with a choice of making life more expensive for their voters, they say, we're not going to do that. That's right, yes. And when you face them with an easy choice of saying, well, some future date will do something you won't like. 2050 is a long time away. I appreciate that. I mean, what the government needs to be doing, and especially with electric cars is making sure you've got EV charging points around the place. There are none in my area. Uh, when I looked to buy an electric car, it would cost £7,000 more um, and I'd have to rip my garage apart to put 18, 800 quid's worth of electric charger in it. Until you make it easier, it ain't going to happen. So I go back to what Paul was talking about incentives. Those are the kind of incentives that would make people want to buy electric cars. Uh, and the lines of an Aston Martin are so beautiful, one doesn't want them interrupted or not having that roar of power as they move off from a red traffic light. Thank you to my panel. Coming up next, State of the Nation's Book Club features Art Duke Edward von Habsburg on his new book, The Habsburg Way. GB News Breakfast, every day from 6 a.m. I don't think you can go and watch a Shakespeare play unless you already know it. It's yes. almost like you have to understand the story, the story. and the characters and yeah. perhaps have even done a bit of reading into it. Because if you went completely blind, especially in today's world where we don't speak in that kind of way, um, it is, I think, probably a bit alienating. But Dawn, Dawn is saying it is alienating at the moment because of the lack of uh, representation. You know, what, the actual phrasing they use, right, OK. The disproportionate representation um, propagated white, able heterosexual cisgender male narratives I'm sure there's people sitting in a room going what's the most ridiculous thing we can come up with together yes. but are really just chuck all these words and it's cisgender and it's just insane mm. of course Shakespeare was what it was back in the day and that's why it is it's mostly blokes and they're mostly white and lots of speculation that he was actually gay isn't there because he never really saw Anne Hathaway very often and stayed away a lot of the time. I don't know, he, maybe he was a big He might have been transgender icon. for all I, I know. know. I mean, I, I don't... <laughs> Begins, I'm looking at you. No, I think you're right. I mean, you know, I think uh, you know, that goes for the profession too. Mm. Mm. Uh, I mean, it, it's... Uh, I, I, I do think we... I mean, I remember seeing Macbeth in London with Judi Dench and Ian McKellen, and it was one of the most exciting wow. evenings ever. And it was a cold night at the Donmar Theatre, outside and inside, and it, that gave it atmosphere. There are certain things, and then you go along and see something else, and you think, I'll walk out in the interval. Yeah. Macbeth is, is so a sexy bad. play, though. Let's talk about... Um, oh, there's so many. Can I live to be 100? Oh, um, this is depressing. I think it is depressing. Oh. I like to stay here now. I don't want to live to 100. Oh, don't and say I'm that. right behind you. I don't you. even want to. My father died at 63. That'll be me gone this year.
I'm Patrick Christie's every weeknight from nine I bring you two hours of unmissable explosive debate and headline grabbing interviews what impact has that had we got death threats and the bomb threats on our job is to do what's in the best interest of our country you made well, my I'm argument so... for me my guests and I tackle the issues that really matter with a sharp take on every story I'm hearing it up and down the country that was a beginning not an end. Patrick Christie's tonight from 9 pm only on GB News, Britain's news channel. Join me, Camilla Tomini, every Sunday at 9 30 when I'll be interviewing the key players in British politics and taking them to task. And this report basically says that he's not fit to stand trial. With an upcoming election looming over Westminster, now is the time for clear, honest answers. I agree. And that's precisely what I'll get. Is he indecisive? Incompetent? That's the Camilla Tomini Show at 9.30 every Sunday on GB News, the People's Channel, Britain's election channel. Well, we've been talking about Boris Churchill and Aston Martins, and I've had a mail mog from Ian Fleming's nephew, who says, my uncle Ian would heartily approve of your sentiments, read petrol Astons and Bentleys. Well, thank you very much, Adam. Al also says, a photographer pulled Winston's cigar out of his mouth, causing his surprise and scowl. That image seconds later is recognised as the finest photo Churchill ever sat for. And now, time for the moment you've all been waiting for, State of the Nations Book Club with Archduke Edward von Habsburg for his new book, The Habsburg Way. The Habsburg dynasty arose from Switzerland in the Middle Ages and came to all swathes of Central and Eastern Europe in various forms for over 600 years. They established a seat of power in Vienna, which was transformed into a cultural and imperial metropolis. Revolution, however, swept across Europe in 1848 and unsettled the secure, structured existence that characterised life under the Habsburgs. Military defeats and nationalist fervour in the wake of 1848 eventually led to the Compromise of 1867, when the weakened Habsburgs ceded to sovereignty demands from their Hungarian subjects and established the dual monarchy of Austria-Hungary. Austria-Hungary continued a slow decline which was immortalised by authors such as Stefan Zwig and Joseph Roth through the rest of the 19th century. Ultimately, in 1918, after the defeat of the Central Powers in the First World War, the empire was dissolved and the last Habsburg emperor, 30-year-old Charles I, was sent into exile, initially to Switzerland and then to Madeira. And yet, the Habsburg name has not disappeared from European political life. I'm so delighted today to be joined now by Archduke Edward of Austria, Hungary's ambassador to the Holy See. Well, Your Excellency, thank you very much for joining me. Uh, you are the Archduke of Austria. Can you explain to me what that means and how you come to have this fantastic title? Um, I'm not the Archduke. I'm one of the Archdukes of Austria because, very simply said, every Habsburg is an Archduke of Austria. And it's a title that we discovered we had uh, in the 15th century uh, from a very spurious document that was supposedly written by Caesar himself. And um, at, at first the emperor didn't agree with this document that we found, but a bit later a Habsburg was emperor, and then it became law. So since then we are archdukes. Your family um, were minor princes and then suddenly became Holy Roman Emperor, emperor Rudolf in the 13th century. Yes, indeed. Uh, Rudolf was a count somewhere between Switzerland, France and Germany around uh, Le Mans Lake. And, uh, and then after the interregnum, uh, which were nearly 50 years uh, of no emperor, uh, the prince electors decided to, to take someone who was harmless, friendly, old and would certainly not found a, a dynasty. And so they choose Rudolf of Habsburg. And, uh, and so his job was to clean up the, the empire again. And one of the things he had to do is to, to, to see that the parts of the empire that had been taken over by others, Ottokar of Bohemia had taken Austria, would get into good hands. And he handed it to his sons. And that's how the Austrian power base of the Habsburgs came about. The emperor who's best known in the United Kingdom uh, is the Emperor Charles V, yes. because he was um, the nephew of Catherine of Aragon yes. and was, of course, the emperor at the point at which the Reformation came about. Yes. Um, now, his election is fascinating because Francis I of France and Henry VIII both think they've got a chance of being Holy Roman Emperor, but yes. of course they don't. 
No, they don't. And the interesting thing was that nobody expected it to be that unanimous how he was, how he was. And the moment he became emperor, he was thrown into one of the greatest crises because Reformation divided his empire into opposing, uh, opposing parties. You never had that. Um, you never had that in the history of the Holy Roman Empire. So. He agreed to doing the Diet of Worms and to confront that heretic, uh, Luther, to give him free access and to guarantee his safety. And, uh, and then he made a very, very clear statement. I'm very proud of, I have to, as a Catholic, I have to say, he said very clearly, um, for, for 2,000 years, 1,500 years, the greatest things of the Church have agreed to these points. Why should I follow one German monk on this. My ancestors always stood with Rome, and that's what we'll do. And so Luther is a heretic, according to him. Then the First World War, and Franz Joseph, very elderly emperor at that point, um, dies, what, 1916? 1916. Uh, and it doesn't quite end there, but it almost does. It almost does. In fact, if you ask my Habsburg family members what who their favorite Habsburg is, of all these great characters we just spoke about, they would point to that friendly, mild-spoken, mustache-wearing young man that ruled for one and a half years, oh. lost the war, lost the empire, and died miserably in exile in Madeira one and a half years later, or a year later. And uh, why? Why is this this harmless man? Many people don't even realize he exists. For us, Habsburgs, and for many, such a great example, because he is a giant of faith. He's a giant of faith, and his faith influenced his social politics, and his faith influenced everything. Especially that from the first moment that he was on the throne, he tried to bring about peace in this terrible First World War, being called by the Pope. But he tried to jump onto every possible peace initiative because he had seen battle in the trenches. He has been, he's been on every front of the war. So he's a great example to all of us. Tell me what happens when a Habsburg goes to meet his maker in bodily form and gets to the doors of the cathedral. Ah, that's beautiful. Uh, we have the knocking ritual. It's absolutely beautiful, and I've seen it twice, although I never lived in an empire, but they resurrected this thing uh, when uh, Empress Zita, the last Austrian empress, was buried. I was present, and when Otto, her son, was buried, they, they twice did this again. Um, it's very touching. Um, the, the coffin arrives at the door of the Kapuzinergruft, which is the burial place of the Habsburgs, and the master of ceremony knocks at the door, and he says, um, uh, and the voice from inside, the Kapuzin monk, says, who is there? And the master of ceremonies will say all the titles. Uh, Franz Joseph, Emperor of Austria, King of Hungary, King of Croatia, and, and all that, like 30 seconds of titles. And he will say, we don't know him. And then he will knock again, said, who is there? And then the master of ceremony will list all the achievements of the ruler. And again, the voice says, we don't know him. And the third time he knocks and he says, who is there? Franz Joseph, a poor sinner. And then the door opens and he can enter. Why did the Habsburgs do that? Because the Habsburgs were profoundly aware that they were an example um, to their subjects. With their death, with their way of being buried, they wanted to teach a good Catholic what it means to die. And a Habsburg ruler was as much a poor sinner, even if he was splendidly dressed, than anybody in his reign. And people took notice. People took notice. This is the way you die. Uh, yeah, perhaps, yeah, yeah. Nowadays, we don't think much about death, but the Habsburgs did all their lives. And it underpinned their, their faith. We haven't unfortunately got time to go into um, the Emperor Maximilian's uh, instructions on on his death, oh. which again are so symbolic. Yes. Uh, it is a wonderful book. I greatly enjoyed reading it. Your family is one of the most interesting uh, in the world. Perhaps only the Windsors provide you with any serious competition. Absolutely. Thank you so much, Rex, and for coming on and talking and uh, for the work you do as ambassador to the Holy See. Thank you very much for your time. Thank you.
Well, I'd strongly recommend the book, and that's all from me. Up next, it's Patrick Christie's. Patrick, what are you going to be discussing this evening? Yeah, we're just getting some news through now that three of Harry Kane's children have been injured in a horror car crash in Germany. Apparently, they've been taken to hospital. We're going to have more detail on that developing story. Uh, I'm also asking whether or not it's time to forgive the Labour Party over the way that they've gone about smearing people who were concerned about trans uh, kids. Four billion pounds given to asylum seekers, and you don't have to swim to join the Royal Navy. I'm also asking why people on the left seem to hate Britain, Jacob. Well, that will all be very interesting, as always, and is coming up after the weather. And I'm glad to report that it will be sunny for the next fortnight, because I've taken my umbrella to be repaired to Swain, Aidney and Brig, and when I took it in, they assured me that I wouldn't need it for the next fortnight, and that will give them time to restore their fine weather-shielding accoutrement. In Somerset, as you know, the weather's always sunny, so it's my London umbrella rather than one that I would need in God's Own County. A brighter outlook with Bob Solar, sponsors of weather on GB News. Good evening. Welcome to your latest GB News weather update. Well, it will be a cloudy start tomorrow, but it should brighten up later on in the day. But for the far northwest, we're likely to see fairly persistent rain. High pressure is starting to spread its influence into southern areas of the UK, but further north and west, we'll see weather fronts push in through the next few days. And this evening, much of the rain will be restricted to the far north and west of Scotland. Also, parts of northwest England, Cumbria, will likely see some heavy bursts of rain throughout this evening. Elsewhere throughout the night it should stay largely dry away from the coasts and over the hills but it's going to be a very cloudy and mild night temperatures again double digits by for a minimum. Across the far northeast of Scotland, it should be a fairly dry and bright start, perhaps some areas in the Midlands as well. But by and large, it's going to be a fairly cloudy start to the day. It'll likely stay quite cloudy and wet for much of the day across parts of western Scotland, northwest England, Northern Ireland as well. But elsewhere, it should brighten up and it'll feel fairly warm once again in that sunshine. We could see temperatures as high as 21 degrees on Friday. That band of rain becomes a more weak feature, but it will sink into more part of northern areas of Wales, more widely across northern England, perhaps into the Midlands later on in the day and Saturday. Behind it, it turns much more unsettled, some showery outbreaks of rain, and it'll also turn considerably colder for those northwestern areas. But in the south, it should remain largely dry and bright for the weekend. Looks like things are heating up. Boxed boilers, sponsors of weather on GB News. This is your chance to win our biggest prize of the year so far. First, there's a totally tax-free £10,000 in cash for you to spend this summer. Then we want to send you on a bespoke seven-night small boat cruise for two worth £10,000. Thanks to Variety Cruises, you'll be able to choose from any of their 2025 Greek adventures and discover Greece like never before. And with flights, meals, drinks and excursions included, all you have to do is relax. We'll also give you these terrific travel treats for another chance to win a prize worth over £20,000, text PRIZE to 63232. Text costs £2 plus one standard network rate message. Or post your name and number to GB04, PO Box 8690, Derby DE19 T. UK only. Entrance must be 18 or over. Lines close at 5pm on the 26th of April. Full terms and privacy notice at gbnews.com forward slash win. Please check the closing time if listening or watching on demand. Good luck. Are the newspapers getting you down? My wife didn't divorce me that month. <laughs> <laughs> Struggling to separate the wheat from the chaff. I know that it's a bit of a circus at the best of times. <laughs> well, don't worry. Headliners has got you covered. We'll take the burden of reading the day's news, and if we get depressed, who cares? It's an occupational hazard, frankly. That's Headliners on GB News from 11pm till midnight, and the following morning, 5 till 6am, on GB News, the comedy channel. Nah, just kidding. Britain's news channel. 2024, a battleground year. The year the nation decides. As the parties gear up their campaigns for the next general election. Who will be left standing when the British people make one of the biggest decisions of their lives? Who will rise and who will fall? Let's find out together. For every moment, the highs, the lows, the twists and turns. We'll be with you for every step of this journey. In 2024, GB News is Britain's election channel. 
GB News is the home of free speech. We were created to champion it, and we deliver it day in, day out. Free speech allows us all to explore and debate openly the issues most important to us, our families, and of course, the British people. Having challenging conversations to enlighten each other. Which is why we hear all sides of the argument. We are the people's channel. We will always stand by the freedom to express yourself. On TV, radio, and online. This is GB News, Britain's news channel. Good afternoon, Britain. Good afternoon, Britain. Weekdays from midday, we bring you the most compelling stories from across the United Kingdom. And why it matters to you. From your doorstep to our inbox. That's right, we want to hear from you. Good afternoon, Britain. Only on GB News, the people's channel, Britain's news channel. I'm Martin Daubney. This is GB News, Britain's news channel. It's 9pm, I'm Patrick Christie's tonight. But these guests are not holidaymakers. They're asylum seekers. Four billion pounds in foreign aid spent on refugees and asylum seekers, plus... Sure, I was born in Carlisle, but I was made in the Royal Navy. You no longer need to swim to be in the Royal Navy, and... The idea of linking trans people with predators, frankly, is disgusting, and you should be ashamed. No forgiveness for Labour MPs over trans madness, plus... Very confident in Andrew. Confident? I'm very confident in Andrew. Rayner has... 100% confident. Rayner gets the kiss of death, and... When I look at some of the things that we're, we're, we're doing now, I think that, or that are being done in the name of Conservatism, I think they're absolutely, absolutely nuts. Boris gets stuck into the Prime Minister, also... It's the failure to incentivise people to work that then allows it to become a lifestyle choice paid for by others that seems to me to be the problem. Is being on benefits a lifestyle choice? On my panel is GB News star Nana Aquir, founder of Global Britain, Amman Bagal, and ex-Labour advisor Matthew Laza. And are you ready for the terrifying drug heading to the UK, the flesh-eating zombie apocalypse? Get ready, Britain. Here we go. Billions for foreigners, nothing for Brits. Next. At just after nine o'clock, this is the top story from the GB newsroom. A sub-postmistress who was wrongly jailed while she was pregnant has refused to accept the apology of a post office executive who sent an email in 2010 saying her conviction was brilliant. David Smith told the post office inquiry that with hindsight, he understood the anger and upset, as well as the substantial distress he'd caused to Seema Misra and her family, saying he was sorry for the way his email had been perceived and portrayed. Mrs Misra was falsely accused of stealing £74,000 and had to give birth wearing a probation tag. She said, I was eight weeks pregnant. They need to apologise to my youngest son. It was terrible. Between 1999 and 2015, more than 900 sub-postmasters were prosecuted due to flawed Horizon IT software. In the United States, the former American footballer O.J. Simpson has died of cancer at the age of 76. His family said today he died surrounded by his children and grandchildren. O.J. Simpson was acquitted of killing his ex-wife, Nicole Brown Simpson, and her friend, Ron Goldman, in 1994 at a trial that gripped America. Almost 100 million people tuning in live to see the now-famous pursuit of O.J. Simpson driving his white Ford Bronco, followed by multiple police cars across L.A. After his record-breaking career in the NFL, he became an actor and had roles in films. But in 2008, he was convicted for his role in a Las Vegas armed robbery and served almost nine years in prison. Here, a Moroccan asylum seeker on trial for the murder of a pensioner in Hartlepool has told police he was motivated by the conflict in Gaza. 45-year-old Ahmed Ali denies murdering 70-year-old Terence Carney as well as the attempted murder of his housemate, Javed Nouri, last November. He says he carried out the attacks as an act of revenge for Israel's killing of children in the Palestinian conflict. He's also accused of assaulting two female police officers who interviewed him after his arrest. 
The Royal Mail has said today it's working to remove counterfeit stamps from circulation after an increase in reports of fakes being sold in shops and online. The Telegraph reported today China is flooding Britain with counterfeit Royal Mail stamps, with small retailers buying forgeries online. It's understood that the fakes were causing a rise in complaints when stamps bought from legitimate stores were being deemed fraudulent, resulting in a £5 fine for the user. And as you've been hearing, the former Prime Minister Boris Johnson has attacked Rishi Sunak's flagship no-smoking policy as absolutely nuts as he criticised the state of the Conservative Party while at an event in Canada. The Prime Minister's plan would prevent anyone who's turning 15 this year or younger from ever being able to legally buy tobacco products. Boris Johnson expressed his frustration at the idea. Some of the things that were... We're, we're doing now, I think, that, or that are being done in the name of conservatism, I think they're absolutely, absolutely nuts. And, uh, but, you know, we're banning cigars. Mm. And what, what, what is... I mean, maybe, maybe you all think that's a great idea. I just can't, I just can't see... Well, what, what is the point of banning... Well, the, 